Okay, so welcome back. This welcome is back. part two of The Road to Infidelity with Anitra Durand Allen and Harold Allen. We hope that you enjoy it. All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so he had, you know, and and I'm I'm not like trying to like drag your dirt up, but you know, it's something mm -hmm. that we don't we yeah. haven't talked about a lot. Yeah. Like in public, but in his first marriage, um there were some things that he could have done differently. Like I think, you know, there's there are extenuating circumstances and I kind of feel like she was just gonna do what she was gonna do anyway. But um <laughs> there were things that you could have done differently that may have turned out, you know, turned your marriage around. Yeah. But one of the things that, you know, he talked about when we were friends, like when we had first met, he was saying that his ex-wife had a, had a problem with one of his coworkers because they were really, really good friends. And after like meeting this coworker and seeing their interactions, like my response was, hell, I would have thought you were cheating with her too. Like, I don't want you being friends with her. <laughs> I was like, I wouldn't be comfortable with it because it was, it was an emotional connection, even though there was nothing going on, it mm -hmm. was still something that kind of like, um, it was very detrimental to your first marriage because yeah. you had established this close connection with someone else. Yeah. And, and, and in my, in my mind, I was like, okay, where am I going to put this emotion? It has to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's there. There's an emotional need there. And my wife ain't doing it. So where else am I going to put it? It has to go somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that that's kind of where it landed. Do you want to talk about that? You want me to jump on? Jump in? I know you want me to oh. jump on, but not on camera. Um, jump in. <laughs> I mean, it's not that kind of show. That's right. That's <laughs> not, not right. <laughs> that's right. I don't have any friends, so I don't think I have a perspective. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, you got you got at least one friend. <laughs> Who likes to bring him red velvet donuts? But that's a whole different conversation. Um, Take a sip of coffee or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like coffee. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I do, the the emotional connection I do think is actually the most dangerous um, when we're talking about protecting our marriages and relationships uh, and the, you know, the pathway, the road to infidelity. For me, this person was someone who was a regular part of our, I won't say everyday life, but a regular part, routine part of our life. Mm -hmm. um, and we all had a relationship um, with one another. I won't share how, because um, that would be a little too revealing, but because of the fact that I continually encountered and engaged this person on a routine basis in a professional capacity, mm -hmm. um, I think that also kind of led to, you know, when I brought it up, when I first, when we first met this person, um, probably within a few months, I brought it up and I was like, this dude likes me. <laughs> like, like, I don't know if he realizes how transparent he is. Um, but it makes me a little uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, we talked about, you know, maybe he should be the one to do the interaction from moving forward and life just happened and it just wasn't feasible or practical for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had had the conversation and we talked about it and I was like, all right, he knows, I know we're going to move forward. We're going to deal. But the longer the relationship was established, we have a, a multiple years relationship with this person. Um, and the longer the relationship was established, the more forward he became mm -hmm. in the, the communication. Um, and I'm going to be honest, like, you know, Harold and I, we've been together since college. We've been together for over 20 years. I don't know what the dating game is like. I've never really contemplated stepping outside of my marriage or I don't have game like that. Like, I'm not trying to, you know, flirt with anybody or be on anybody's list or catch anybody's eye, especially not the old man at the gas station. <laughs> um, but I could, I could feel the intensity of the interaction growing 
And instead of addressing them head on, I dismissed it as we just have a good relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, we just cool like that, right? Um, I ignored some of the things that he said. Um, and let's be real honest. Uh, when they were complimentary, I liked it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everybody likes when they are being given positive attention. And for me, with my love language being words of affirmation, um, it doesn't, I'm not going to say it doesn't take much, but the communication, which was the easiest part of our interaction, those words, mm-hmm. that was the thing that got to me the most. That was the thing that impacted me in a way um, that was meaningful and that led me to feel connected to this person in a deeper way. So at the same time where he was offering these compliments that I was filing away in a, but not trying to engage, um, he was also seeking assistance from me in other aspects, right? Like he had a problem with one of his kids. He asked me some questions. Um, he had a disagreement with his wife. He asked me what I thought. Um, there were just ways that our interaction was slowly moving from professional to personal. Mm -hmm. And I did not check them the way that I should have. Number one, because it made me feel good. (laughs) Number two, um, a lot of times it was beneficial to me, right? Um, He gave us a discount Uh, for the services he provided because I I offered him uh, something in return, right? And it wasn't like a, it wasn't a sexual interaction or an inappropriate interaction, right? It was, it was an up and up professional interaction. Um, But because I offered it, he gave me a discount. It was beneficial to me. Yeah. You know, and so I accepted it, even though I knew that we were getting to a point subconsciously I knew like you know I would tick it off and you know every time it got to be a little worse and a little more forward and a little worse and a little more forward I would go you know one of these days he's gonna say something and I'm gonna have to check him instead of checking him right then so it didn't get to that point right right um and so yeah the emotional attachment is definitely one that is probably the most dangerous you know when you're talking about um marital infidelity (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah and i think um part of the checking the other person is also checking myself um Mm -hmm. making sure i am okay putting up um i'm resetting the boundary like boundary was like way out there no what okay bring it back okay you know went back i need to put you back on the other side of the boundary because even though on the surface it looks like everything is cool emotionally this is getting into territory that you should not be in Mm -hmm. and i think it's um it would be wise of us to check ourselves why we're also checking the other person too Mm -hmm. definitely um i you know was preparing for this talk and i i couldn't help but laugh because i i was thinking about how like when he's concerned about someone getting too close to me that my response is like he all this person needs to worry about is which one of us gonna swing on him first because i'm like i'm i'm i got napoleon complex and ready to fight and he just you know protective husband ready to fight like one of us gonna swing on him first like that's the only thing we got to figure out who's swinging first (laughs) and more than likely it's gonna be her because i in my mind you don't even have to explain anymore yes she's gonna swing first In my mind, I was swung. I was like, why is this person not realizing, not reading the room and not understanding? Like, okay, I'm not saying nothing to you and I'm not smiling. I'm just looking at you. (laughs) What don't you understand about this body language? Yeah. Go ahead. I just, but I just, I get tickled because, and see, for me, um, I have, I have a history of um, sexual abuse. So, my I'm already more guarded in interactions with people of the opposite sex because it's more of a I think it's more of a fight or flight response like I don't 
I don't typically let people get close enough to me to be able to see, you know, how far they can kind of push the lines. Because the first time you say something, I'm like, no, we fighting, you can't do this. But that's, that's, a, that's a response from the abuse that I've dealt with. I don't think we deal with that too much just in our personal marriage, but um, that is definitely something that, you know, you have to be wary of. And, you know, talking about having your needs met, um, it's hard when the other person doesn't know what your needs are like it's harder for them to meet those needs if you've never expressed them or if you've expressed them and your partner is not receiving it. Mm -hmm. um, or if they change. Yeah, they, and they do change. Um, <laughs> he's like, he's like, oh, why are there so many therapists? <laughs> <laughs> um, but so Harold, if I can ask you this, like how, if any way, has your perception of like, male female relationships changed like when it comes to anitra and your marriage like has anything changed for you because of this um i know that i so much think anything has changed more than i need to be um observant mindful and responsive mm -hmm. fact of the matter is my wife she just doesn't have um she has more male friends than female friends. And that goes back to, you know, our days in college. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that dynamic in and of itself doesn't, isn't really any different. Um, but as a man, you know, I innately know every man is a man, right? And so, you know, they don't have, so they have the same motives and agenda um perspectives values uh and so as such you know i need to be more protective i need to be more responsive i need to be more mindful um of who she's engaging with mm -hmm. how she's engaging with them yeah and in this day and age i don't care what your gender is um i just need to know <laughs> uh, <laughs> One of the things that he said to me, you know, when we were having these conversations and debriefing, um, when I um, told him, because I, I told him, I, I, he didn't discover anything, he didn't, you know, find anything out. Um, it had come to a point where I was no longer able to continue with the kind of behavior. Um, that I had been exhibiting and realized that if I went forward, things would go much worse and go much further, right? Like, you know, we, like I said, I saw this person on a routine basis. Those interactions began to be um, more inappropriate. Um, we would communicate by phone and by messenger and text and that kind of thing. And those interactions got to be much more, um, boundary crossing, crossing the line, you know, saying things that, um, as Harold said, he wouldn't say that in front of me, so he shouldn't be saying that to you when I'm not present. Right. Yeah, so when, as we were having these conversations and debriefing, you know, once I told him, the one thing that he said to me that, you know, I don't know, like I said, we've been together since college, so I don't know that I really considered this, but even in my interactions with this person up to this point, because like I said, we've known this person for four to five years. Um, no to a man means try harder. Mm. Uh, and so basically, you know, what has happened over the course of knowing this person and being in direct contact with them on a regular basis is that the advances and the flirting and the conversation and the banter and the back and forth got more forward and became more direct and got stronger um, because my rejection was just an invitation to go harder yeah and i'm not sure that i ever really thought about it that way um because i am rejection averse <laughs> i don't like to be rejected it hurts my feelings <laughs> and I retreat when I am rejected. Um, 
And so that was something that I hadn't considered. And I'm not saying that it's, you know, a stereotypical gender issue, yeah. um, but definitely something, you know, that is typographic for some people that, you know, when they're rejected, that just means they're going to do whatever it is that it takes to go to the next level. And that might mean that their behavior escalates. Um, and so that's another thing to be mindful of. If you're interacting with someone, whether you like it or not, whether it's beneficial or not, whether it's feeding your ego or not, because that's really what it is at the end of the day is your ego. Um, when you see that their behavior is escalating and going to the next level and the next level and the next level, that's a warning sign. It's yeah. a warning sign for you to pull back, um, check yourself and check that other person if it's something that you don't want to continue. Yeah. I think um, I, I realized a, a long time ago, like to speak to your point about, you know, rejection is kind of like, you know, try harder. Um, like to me, it, it made me think of like men or women who go after, you know, like a married person. It's kind of like trying to prove a point. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you like you've set this goal to accomplish like, I bet, you know, and I see it especially like when you have someone who says, you know, I have an amazing marriage. I love my marriage. I love my husband. Like nothing ever going to break us up, you know, and it's, I feel like it's the enemy moving behind the scenes and saying, I'm going to prove a point that your marriage is not as strong as you think it is. And I'm going to come in and be the one to prove that point. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of like, how, how much can you endure? before you break and give in. Um, and I think it's it's got a lot of similarities in the story of Job, where mm -hmm. like, you know, Job's whole faith was put to the test, but like our marriages are put to the test in that, you know, in a very similar way when somebody comes in and says, I'm going to keep trying and trying and trying because you tell me that you have a strong marriage, but I don't believe you. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be the person to prove you wrong. Yeah. Like, seen yeah. it. <laughs> And that's what a part of me is like, okay, this person wants to escalate their advances. Well, then I need to escalate my defense. Yeah. Not only do I need to say no, I need to say hell no. Or I might need to say, hey, my wife is here. Is Now you fighting both of us. Right. Or, or do I need to call the police and get a restraining order? Like, how far do you want to take this? Because I can take it that much further. Yeah. As, as, much, uh, as much as that other person wants to advance things, you have to be willing to do, you have to be able to beat that. Yeah. It is much easier said than done. I'll, I'll, I will be perfectly honest. Um, I haven't, I have only seen this person one time mm -hmm. since we had the conversation. And while everything within me is fighting for my marriage and getting my mental health back on track and, um, you know, dealing with the grief that I have been experiencing and allowing that to, um, enhance my interactions and moving forward and not, not prevent it. Um, a concern that I have is what is going to happen inside of me mm -hmm. when I see this person again, when I have to see them in person, as opposed to, you know, some other kind of interaction, what's going to happen because everything within me rationally knows that I don't want this, but that doesn't mean that that connection that was established just disappeared because I decided I don't want this. Right. And that's something that we have to be realistic with ourselves about. And we have to be honest with ourselves about that. Right. Like the, the, the fact is I know it's wrong, but the honest part of me says, I don't know that's going to stop what's physiologically and emotionally happening inside of me. Mm -hmm. right. Because it's still a need that you have. And that need is now being met by the person I wanted to meet it to begin with, but that doesn't sever the connection that mm -hmm. was established, right? Like I said, we never had physical intimacy. We never had physical contact as a part of this thing. Like I said, we had a relationship for years. We've hugged, shaken hands, you know, touched, fist bumped, whatever. We have had physical contact, um, but not as a part of the infidelity or the inappropriate relationship that we have. Um, but that doesn't mean that the emotional connection isn't still there. Um, because I do believe, and I don't know that it is, again, a gender stereotype for me, I can only speak for me, I can't be physically intimate with someone that I don't have an emotional connection to. 
Right. Yeah. That's just who I am. And, and I know that the emotional connection was far more dangerous. And that was the thing that hurt me the most in hurting him um, is that I allowed another person to occupy my mind. And mm -hmm. I allowed another person to occupy that space of my emotional being that should have been devoted to him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Like you said, definitely easier said than done. I didn't try to, I wasn't trying to make it sound like it was easy. People <laughs> 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 in the back understand that yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> yes. right. Now, <laughs> right now that we've been over it, but you know, you asked me when this was happening and I don't know that I would have been able to honestly say that to you. Right. And it's, it's, um, I think, you know, the biggest takeaway from that is that it's not, it's not the other person. Like we have to deal with what that emotion is inside of ourselves, that need is inside of ourselves, because if we don't figure out what is it inside of me that makes room for another person to come in and occupy that space, this particular person could, you know, move to another city it still leaves room for someone else. It doesn't have to be the same person because the person is just kind of like the manifestation of mm -hmm. what is going on inside of me. Yeah. Like I need to deal with me first. It doesn't matter who the other person is. Yeah. Like this is all on me. And it's not always a, a someone. Sometimes it's something yeah. like pornography. Yeah. Fellas. Not for you, J pornography, fellas. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, or, or work. Yeah. Or, or your children. You know, like that, that was one of the things, <laughs> all of the things that we could have had disagreements about in our marriage in the year of 2019. I think we did um, have disagreements about. And, you know, one of the things that I said to him that um, I think was really hurtful for both of us was, you know, we, 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 we run a track team. Our daughter runs track. She's a competitive sprinter. I ran track. And, he, <laughs> and I said to him one time that I wish you put in as much effort into our marriage and meeting my needs as you do into planning her track career. Mm -hmm. And that definitely came from a place of hurt that was present again because of the emotional void that I was feeling um, from having lost my dad and not really being able to deal with the grief. And that's a whole different conversation for a different podcast that we should talk about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there are many, many other things that can take up space in your marriage and lead you to not being able to meet your spouse's or your partner's needs that don't have to be another person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of other things. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about, there's a book that uh, when I was in grad school, getting my certification, um, that I chose to do my, uh, do a, a study on, and it's called um, His Needs, Her Needs, Building an Affair Proof Marriage. So this, this is the book um, by Willard F. Harley. Um, there's a, you know, there's a lot, but just to summarize it, the book talks about I, being able to identify what your needs are as a woman and being able to identify what your needs are as a man and how, and identifying what your needs are as a wife and a husband, because they're, those are different life stages and you have different needs during different life stages. And it talks about, you know, all of the things that we've kind of discussed here you know, communication, emotional attachment, like all of the things that can lead up to an affair and how to kind of stop those things in their tracks. Um, and Anitra, you brought up, you know, the love languages. And I think, you know, it's getting, love languages are getting a lot more traction these days, mm -hmm. but people still don't really understand do what they are. Mm -hmm. um, and don't understand that your love language can change as you get older and you have kids or, or you know, kids leave the house, like things change. Um, but being able to know what your love language is and know what your spouse's love language is 
is so important to, you know, stop infidelity because, I mean, it's, it's just one of the many factors, but it's very important because if I don't know how to give him love, somebody else is going to figure that out and be able to give him the love that he can't get from me and vice versa. And even if they don't figure it out, um, cause this is what happened to me. I was emotionally void and not feeling as though he was loving me the way that I needed to be. And that other person had no clue that mm -hmm. what they were doing was filling that void. They were just doing what they had always been doing. So mm -hmm. it might not even be that their intention is to come into that space when they engage with you or when they interact with you. It might just be that because you haven't filled it and you haven't found a way to have that need met where it should be, <laughs> mm -hmm. that somebody else can come into there and, and fill that need. You know, I wanted Harold to fill that need, but he and I weren't in a space where we could do that. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that what I was experiencing with this other person felt like what I needed and felt like what I wanted. And so I gravitated to that because I wasn't getting it from here. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, Harold and I, we had this conversation the other day, actually. I never wanted a relationship with that person. Right. And after he and I had our conversation, I told that person like, hey, I've told my husband, this is what it is. I think it's fair for you to know because, oh, by the way, you're gonna see each other again. <laughs> it's not fair for you not to know that. Um, and his response was unexpected. Um, like, as my husband said, I had a whole boyfriend. But um, his response was unexpected because our interaction didn't feel like his intention was to feel that need. Mm -hmm. He was trying to feel what he wanted. He really care about me <laughs> or anybody else for that matter. He was yeah. trying to get what he wanted. Um, and so we all, we have to be careful when we have those voids because you might not, they, that person might not even have any intention yeah. of trying to fill that void or, or step into that space. It just might be that what they do that day at that time does it for you and you find yourself in trouble. <laughs> yeah. So, and I'm going to ask this question because I, I really want, um, Harold, I really want you to have a voice in this because I think while you're not all men, I think that men need to hear from you being in this situation. Um, and please reframe my question if you need to. Um, but was there, was there something, what was it within you that when, Anitra was um, saying that I needed these, this need to be met, that you did not or were not able to feel that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, hmm, we talk about love languages and, you know, we've, you know, operated under that paradigm for quite some time. Um, just because you know, just because you know, just because I know what her love language is, does not mean I understand or have the capacity to meet it. And so, you know, I spent the better part of our relationship trying to figure out how to meet that need um, explicitly. Mm -hmm. and so, we've had conversations before and she you knows she says oh well you used to do this and you used to do that and you used to do this and i'm like okay well yeah um tell me what i need to do because i i'm at a loss here yeah me you know telling her to tell me what to do only serves a frustrator but unless she helps me help her she can't get what she needs mm -hmm. it's not never been about me not wanting to meet her needs um you know and you know it's always been about okay well how do i do it and you know and sometimes i'm successful 
and sometimes I'm not. Um, you know, sometimes I hit the mark, sometimes I don't. Uh, so, you know, being able to do that on a consistent basis, you know, has been a challenge. Um, and, you know, our uh, efforts to communicate about my challenges, you know, just result in us bumping heads because mm -hmm. my approach is, well, you should know. I'm telling you, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. He's, he's laughing because we have the same. <laughs> so in some, and you know, so in, in some, you know, and so in, in, with respect to some of this, you know, it's a disregard of the things that I'm trying to communicate to you, you know, that I, you know, ha I recognize that I have these deficiencies. Um, what I don't know or understand is, you know, how to address them. Mm -hmm. And so while therapy is not for me, I went to therapy. Yeah. And that's where I found that therapy was not for me. <laughs> for practical solutions. Therapists are at, aren't providing practical solutions. That is not true. They're, you are, you even said that. The ones you I, saw I, weren't. I know this is your I'm time. Talking. But let me just, wait a minute, no, 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 hold no, no, on. No, 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 no. <laughs> let me defend my profession. You, look, you don't have to defend your, your profession because I'm talking about me. The therapists are incidental to this entire thing. No offense. Not yeah. except for when you say that we ain't doing something we can do. <laughs> the therapist that I saw. Thank you. And I will say therapist plural. 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 Um, did not offer multiple solutions, you know, and in multiple conversations with my <laughs> wife. Well, they're, they're there to guide you to the answer. I don't need you to guide me to the answer. I have a problem now, and I don't have six months to solve it. So. <laughs> I need something that's actionable. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm an analyst. I'm an IT guy. I need something that's actionable now. I got you. I so, got you. you know, for, from, you know, so, so that's my perspective. I didn't know it wasn't an unwillingness. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, I haven't been able to consistently do these things. And historically, you know, the things that she, you know, felt that I did that met those needs at previous points of time, you know, I've, you know, migrated away from those things in, in some way. And, you know, I, I don't know how to get back there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not sure what it was specifically or explicitly um, that I was doing <laughs> that me. I was just being me. Mm hmm who I am has evolved over time. So who I am now is not who I was then. And so I have a difficult, I know I have difficulty reconciling, you know, me 20 years ago with me now and with what your needs are now versus what your needs were then. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think- I'm, I'm sorry, Jermaine. Uh, I will say this also. As our relationship has evolved, I have grown and learned um, how to be a wife as opposed to how to be um, sought after, right? So the things that he was doing when he was trying to get me was the stuff that I liked. <laughs> um, once he got me, I still wanted him to do those things and he didn't think he needed to. Um, and so that was a, you know, a, a discrepancy that we had to reconcile. Um, but also, I was still playing hard to get once we were married, because that's what I thought we were supposed to do. And that made him stop doing some of the things that I really wanted. Right? Like, he is very big on PDA. And it's not that I didn't want it. I just wanted him to pursue me. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't actually know how to make that communication, when he would pursue me publicly with signs of affection, I would push him off. Mm -hmm. After a certain amount of time, he just stopped. 
And then it was like, well, why don't you do what you used to do? Well, because I told you not to. <laughs> um, you know, and it was, you know, it really took us kind of going through this kind of significant emotional trauma in our relationship to kind of understand how we got to this point, mm -hmm. how we were at a point that I was so emotionally devoid from, a re from an issue that had nothing to do with our relationship, right? It had nothing to do with our marriage. Um, but because we were in that space, because I was in that space emotionally and our relationship had these bumps in the road, they were exploited by my emotional state. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was going to say, um, I think the way I was thinking about love languages is in the course of a relationship. In the beginning, I think us as pursuers, whoever the pursuer is, we're doing like all the love languages, not really knowing it. We're just doing them all saying, well, you're going to like something. So I'm going to just do all of this stuff. <laughs> but and then when and then once we as the relationship progresses we don't really know what part which which thing you're responding to we're just saying oh well they're doing she's still going out with me so I'm gonna do all this stuff but after a while that gets tiring and it usually gets tiring right after you get married so the day after you're married you're like oh man I gotta do all this stuff no more let me just do, let me just do uh, some of this stuff. And that's where we figure out, man, okay, I got to do something, but I don't really know what to do. So let me just figure out the way to be efficient. At the beginning, we just going pedal to the metal. <laughs> we just doing all the love things. We don't even, we don't even know what, we don't, we don't know if it's that we, I bought you a Coke or bought you a coat. Right. We don't, we don't know if it's dinner or I open the door or this nice smelling cologne I got on, or all this fineness you see, we, I don't know what it is. I just know you responded to something and it's the response I want. Um, and then after marriage, it's kind of like, man, I'm tired. What, what's for dinner? And it's like, wait, what's for dinner? <laughs> what was for dinner two days ago before we was married? <laughs> but I don't know what you're responding to and that's, that's one of the disadvantages of doing all of that stuff in the beginning. And then you get married, it's kind of like, uh, I don't really know what to do. At some point, you just run out of steam. So we, you know, we kind of talked about all of the factors that kind of lead up to infidelity, whether it's, you know, physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever. Um, so I had, I had written a blog post about, you know, the reasons why the thought of a, an affair is so strong and I'm not going to read the blog post because it's really long because I'm very lengthy and wordy. Um, but um, one thing I wanted to highlight, there are several reasons why people have affairs. Um, you know, it's a sense of loneliness or disconnect from their spouse. If you have a loss of interest in your partner's hobbies and leave them to like go out and find someone else to do all of the fun things with. Um, if there is, you know, some sort of emotional abandonment, if you have a lack of, you know, sex or intimacy or, you know, physical connection within the relationship, um, the big thing, you know, we just talked about love languages, like if you're not showing love the way your spouse receives love, um, and that is, that can be very different from the way that you receive it. So knowing how your spouse um, feels loved, you know, is, mm -hmm. is really important. Um, or if your marriage becomes emotionally, mentally, or physically abusive, like that can lead to the person stepping out. Um, but, you know, kind of bringing it back to scripture, um, the second part of Ephesians 427 reads, don't let the devil get a foothold. And we talked about that, you know, at the beginning, beginning of the conversation and Anitra, you, you know, really brought it out and said that, um, you know, infidelity begins in the mind and it moves to the heart. Like all of our behaviors start as a thought in our mind. Um, and especially when it comes to infidelity, like if you don't make a concerted effort to stop this particular kind of cancer, it'll completely take over your marriage and kill it. Like it has that potential. Um, 
so as we're you know kind of wrapping up, Anitra, you had already you had mentioned in this other talk that there are stages to an affair. So if you could briefly explain them um, for the audience, because I really want them to hear this. Um, the first stage you talked about was compromise, then secrecy, then addiction and decision making. Yeah, um, and so I don't want to get too nerdy and <laughs> mental health technical, um, but really, you know, when someone is having an affair or um, let's just call a marital affair, let's just <laughs> get that one. Uh, it's, it is basically the reward center in your brain or what is technically called the dopaminergic effect of rewarding yourself with um, whatever action or behavior is occurring between you and the other person. Um, and so the compromise comes when that boundary is crossed, right? When that initial thing that happens that piques the interest, that plants the seed of the thought in your mind and you give that space to exist mm -hmm. and give that space to live and you don't reject it that's the compromise and when that that moment and that event takes place then the other stages become viable um the secrecy is pretty obvious i think um obviously you would share that information with the person that you're hiding it from mm -hmm. um some people do it openly and i don't understand that but um, secrecy um, in an affair is one of those things that can quickly lead to down the path to where it can become something that will, you know, kill your marriage. If you're hiding the conversations, if, you know, like this person um, said things to me that he would not say to me in front of my husband uh, and I didn't tell him, you know, that secrecy is keeping those things that you have triggered by this thought from your partner or your spouse. Um, and then the addiction is where that reward center dopaminergic effect comes in, right? Every time you get that text, you run into your phone. You're waiting for that person to respond to you in your messages. You're waiting for the next time you get to see that person or you get to talk to them. Um, and the more and more that reward center um, in your brain is, um, the need for those rewards are met, the more you want them. Right. It's like it's it's the it is the mindset um, and the the psychology behind video games. Mm -hmm. It will let you get far so far enough that you get close enough that you just almost win so that you have to keep playing. Right. It's the same concept. You will get close enough to the point that you almost are satisfied. So you just have to keep getting more. Lay's potato chip said nobody can eat just one. Right. Like it, it's the same concept, the same idea. Um, and then the decision-making stage is when you have to be real and honest with yourself and decide, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. Am I going to keep doing this? Am I going to continue to um, maintain this secrecy and, you know, the, this type of behavior that is inappropriate and not healthy for my marriage or myself? Um, or am I going to make the decision to stop it? Am I going to make the decision to end my marriage? Because that is a decision that some people make. I'm not yeah. recommending it. I'm just saying that at that point when you get to decision making, you have a choice to make about how you are going to move forward. And that really will make a big determination in what happens in your relationship, um, both the one that you are stepping out on and the one that you are stepping into. Right. right. So, um, <clears throat> so now, you know, as, as Harold said, like, I need an action plan. Like I need to know what I have to do right now. Like I don't want to talk about it. I want to do it. Um, so two things, um, I think to, you know, just kind of bring it all home, like to two things that are, will be huge and instrumental in, in kind of staving off infidelity. Um, the first thing I think we have to acknowledge our needs and our emotions. Um, I think a lot of times that we get into these situations because like, if I'm feeling like he's not doing the things that I want him to do, I don't speak up because I don't want to cause conflict in my marriage. Like, it's, it's good enough, so I don't want to do anything or say anything that's going to upset the balance uh, or the equilibrium, so I don't address what I'm missing. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of like, you know, it festers. 
I mean, you don't don't speak up, um, or when you don't acknowledge that. And then the next thing is to speak up before you step out. You know, again, if you are not telling your partner what you need, and you're just kind of doing all of this stuff in the background, and he's just blissfully unaware that I'm unhappy. You know, that's you know that's a decision that I've made. Um, we do. I think like twice a year, we do a, a spouse review <laughs> where, you know, we sit down and have a conversation and say, hey, um, huh? So, I mean, the, the manager and I, him, I, I could see. My employer reviews. Oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we, we did, I think in the beginning, did actually like have paper. Like <laughs> we were like writing notes. I but, mean, because there was, you know, the, it was still new, and I think we were still trying to. Some of the stuff I didn't need notes on; I just needed the visual. But uh, <laughs> and other stuff, <laughs> so it's like okay, mental notes. I was just you know making sure I wasn't gonna have to do a three sixty on my marriage. That's all. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> Not necessarily. I, it, it can be done in little stages. In the beginning, you got to do it quarterly. You got to yeah. just do it more often. Sometimes got to do it monthly. But I mean, we like we we just you know kind of check in and say, hey, am I you know, doing, not doing this enough? Like, do you need, are you having enough sex? Are you bored with sex? Do we need to try some new positions? Like, you know, what are you needing from me right now? Um, you know, am I cooking enough? Which is usually, no, I'm not. Um, you know, I'm still eating though. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, just really being intentional on, you know, checking in and saying, Hey, am I meeting your needs in this season? If I'm not, what can I do better? Um, and I told I them, thing about that too is to be sensitive to the other person's ability to have that conversation mm -hmm. i'm a talker i talk all day he don't want to talk so we can't have this conversation every week yeah yeah <laughs> you know, um every quarter might be too much for him although i think that's probably reasonable um uh, we have to be sensitive to the other person's um needs and desires and i was not for a very long time mm -hmm. um force him into doing things and that's part of the reason he retreated um sometimes is because he felt forced into that kind of position yeah so, a written review really yeah. um, i mean it's it's i mean we've done it um <laughs> but you know it's just fill out <laughs> well I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a form um, that's what i'm doing i'm making a form um <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do remember, you know, we had a conversation and I'm one of those kind of people who like, I'll think through an entire conversation and then just say the last part of it. And he's just like, what the hell are you talking about? But I told him one time, I was like, if I was thinking about having an affair, I would tell you. And I think that you, um, I don't know if you kind of came at it from that perspective, Anitra, but I, I honor that you did have that conversation. Um, because when I say, if I'm thinking about having an affair, I would tell you, that means that I have needs that are going unmet. And at this point, I'm considering somebody else being able to come in and meet those needs. And before I do that, I'm mm -hmm. going to tell you, hey, this is how I'm feeling. This is what's going on. We need to make some changes. Yeah. Um, and I think people are afraid to have that conversation because they're, you know, not wanting to hurt the other person. They're not wanting to be hurt. But in a covenant, you have to be humble enough and vulnerable enough to be willing to hear that kind of, you know, quote unquote, criticism. You know, we're not perfect. We're going to mess up. And one thing that I love that I would, you know, really want you to share with our audience is that you created conversation helper cards um, to get people engaged in having the hard conversation. So would you please share that with our audience? Absolutely. Um, and ultimately, these conversation helper cards are things that they're the skills that we want to be able to develop and not need the card <laughs> at some point. But because they're really hard things to access emotionally, uh, the card helped. And part of this, you know, that I came up with was because I'm a talker, he's not. Uh, and so these were things that 
in the midst of our conversations, when we were having those difficult conversations, uh, that I would want to be able to, you know, express to him in a way that he could receive it. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times we can express ourselves, but we don't do so in a way that the other person receives it. And that just escalates the conversation. The other part of it is I have seen so many things in relationships where people want you to get the conversation started, but then they don't offer you any tools for what happens when that conversation goes left. And this is something that I kind of came up with um, to help people. Oh, they're backward. Um, yeah, they're good on our screen. Yeah. To help people, but they're backward on mine. To help people with, um, with this uh, with this particular issue, right? So there's just there um, there's eight different cards. There's eight different things that you know you need to express to someone when you're having that conversation. Um, amnesty, basically, um, I'll share openly if I'm free from consequences. And that was something we did with our kids because a lot of times kids will lie to you because they think they're going to get in trouble when they don't realize if you just be honest with me, we'll deal with whatever you did, but you lie and it just makes it even more worse. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, because sometimes those are the two hardest words for people to say. I was wrong and I hope you can forgive me. Confused. I don't understand. Please explain it differently. Listen, I need to express myself clearly without interruption, uh, which is one he probably should use with me a lot. No, judging, this is hard to say, so please don't respond with negativity um, because a lot of times we won't be honest because we're afraid of the judgment we're going to get or what the other person is going to say. Pause, I need a moment to process, let's come back to this. Uh, and I don't, this is the one that has the most potential to be abused because you'll pause and then never come back to it and that's not the intent. The intent is that you give people the space that they need to process um, so that they can continue in the conversation and still feel safe because that is really the whole point of this. Uh, real talk, this may be hard to hear, but it's being said with love. And I'm going to read the whole back of these cards. So you'll see um, on the cards, there's a front that tells you what it is, but then there's a back that kind of explains how to use it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read the back of this card because this one um, can sometimes be abused as well. Use this card when the words you need to say are truthful and necessary, but may be a little hurtful to the person listening. Do not use this card as an excuse to say hurtful things without consequence. Yes. Yeah. I'm gonna just let that sit there for a minute, let you deal with that one. Um, and then the last one is rephrase. I didn't express that well, allow me to say it differently. And there are many, many more things that, you, that could be used, many more tools that we can access in our communication that help us to have these difficult conversations. Um, and having these cards is just a visual reminder that the person that you're dealing with is experiencing things on the inside that you can't see and they may not be comfortable sharing. They might not feel safe in that space to be able to say, you know what? I really don't understand what you're saying. I really don't get that. Can you explain it to me differently? Um, they may not be okay with sharing something if they feel like they're going to get judgment for what they've said and not a discourse about why what they've said is important to the discussion. Um, and so that's really kind of where that came from in my, you know, 20 something years with this man that I love very dearly. Um, and over the course of dealing with communication, both in professional world and in my, in my personal life, I've come to realize that these are the things that people often have difficulty communicating verbally um, when they're in a tense situation or a tough conversation. And I feel like using these can help make it easier for you to access those things and to communicate them verbally. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying using these cards is going to magically make all of your tensions go away and that every conversation you have from here on out is going to be great. Not at all. But it will help serve as a reminder that we are in this together and this conversation and this discussion is really to help us both um, as well as to manage that, you know, emotionalism that comes up when we're triggered. It's hard to find those words. It's hard to access those words because when your body is triggered and your brain is going through the threat assessment, the fight or flight, it suppresses all those other things that it does like think and breathe and yeah. <laughs> <all those laughs> 
functions that are necessary because right now at that point it's just survival um and as we have evolved to the point that we are you know in history as humans our threat assessment hasn't really changed and so we're still as my psychopathology professor told us we're still seeing people who come at us verbally with attacks like it's a saber-toothed tiger right and so because we haven't let go of the ability to assess that threat we're st our body still responds like we're facing a saber-toothed tiger <laughs> even though we know it's not that is how our physiology is responding and so you know the, the conversation helper cards is really just a way to help people access those things that they need to to keep the discussion going in a safe manner um, and to keep everyone on the same page that this is really beneficial for us both I love it great so do you have anything you'd like to add I always have something to add okay. but I'm not going to <laughs> really <laughs> <laughs> No, okay, I, I, I will add something. A lot of times, so um, I used to be, um, uh, so um, yes, I used to be not a talker. Are you? <laughs> hmm? I asked if you were now. I am, uh, but I, I know I don't talk a lot. Um, and here's why, because <laughs> no, growing up, I faced a lot of, um, so while you were uh, conflict averse, mm -hmm. I am averse to rejection. That That's really how you can really get me to shut down real quick, rejection. And so a lot of times um, I would not say anything because I was told a lot, shut up. Mm -hmm. You're a kid, you don't know any better, shut up. And so I, one day I was like, okay, and I never, I rarely talk. I just shut up for the rest of my life. But um, I think um, the reason why I disengage in conversations is because the conversation is not going to serve me. Mm -hmm. I feel that way. Conversation is not going to serve me. So you know what? If you feel like you want to talk, go ahead. I'll sit there and listen to you. And when you're done talking, we'll be done. Yeah. And so that's until I learned that about myself, you know what, um, even if I feel like the conversation is not going to serve me, I still need to engage at least enough until it's proven that it's not going to serve me in real life, rather than me assuming that it's not going to serve me. Mm -hmm. And so um, I used to be like you, I really did, um, until I realized that, you know what, my voice matters my voice has value and I am going to act and conduct myself as if it does have value because in reality it does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. <laughs> so, uh, before we go, Harold, would you like to say anything else? No, I think you guys, you don't want to have the last word. Oh, no, Lord. I'm technically I'm having the last word. <laughs> There you go. I love it. There you go. I don't know that there's anything for me to add. Is there anything that you would like for me to cover? So, did I miss anything? Did I misstate anything? No. Okay. You can't misstate your opinion. Okay. Or cool. experience. It's true. Yeah. I love it. Y'all are so cute. I'm out, I'm, out, I'm, out, I'm out of liquid. So, yeah, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say, Anitra and Harold, thank y'all so, so, so much for being here. Um, we have truly enjoyed this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm praying that it will serve to help someone who really needed to hear it um, and to help them realize that, you know, you are not alone in your struggles. Um, you know, if infidelity has happened, if there's been a potential for infidelity, um, it is not too late. Your marriage is worth fighting for, and I'm so honored um, I'm so thankful that y'all have honored that decision um, and are using your story to help so many other people. Um, if you would not mind, please let everyone know where they can find you. We will um, share your links and everything in the um, description of this episode, but tell the people where they can find you. Absolutely. Um, my relationship communication and family coaching can be found at Blissful 
family.us because uh, that's what we all want to be. And uh, my parenting strategies and tips for getting more done in less time with less stress can be found at themomonthemove.com and everywhere across social media except Twitter because I hate it. But I do have a Twitter profile. You just don't find me sharing anything there. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, all right. Thank y'all again for being here. Um, we are praying for you and love you and appreciate you. Y'all have a wonderful evening. Oh, be sure to like, oh, yeah, share, subscribe, <laughs> and find us all over the social medias platforms. Yes. At, at Yelp. Yes. There. Yes. Forgot to talk about us, but whatever. It's not important. <laughs> this is all about y'all. <laughs> anyway, y'all have a good one. We'll talk to you soon. Right. Bye. 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 Bye.